Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this session, Empowering Scientists to Dream the Future, uh, the European Research Council. Uh, the mission of the European Research Council is to support uh, scientists uh, who are carrying out frontier research across all domains of science. And we have four fantastic scientists with us here today who are also ERC grantees, uh, who represent really the different fields of science um, across which uh, the ERC is supporting uh, fundamental blue skies, curiosity-driven research. Uh, so we'll be hearing from them in just a moment, and I will introduce them and ask them to come up on stage. But first of all, I would like to call on stage uh, the president of the European Research Council, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, uh, who's uh, a mathematician by training, uh, our president and who will set the scene and frame uh, the session before we hear from our distinguished speakers. Uh, so Professor Bourguignon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello everybody. I'm very pleased to be here for this uh, session on uh, the European Research Council, but of course, as you know, the European Research Council is really uh, fundamentally a bottom-up organization, so we rely fully on the initiative of the researchers. This is really our um, DNA, uh, without any doubt. So the only things uh, I want to say, I say there are three things different. The first one is, of course, uh, we are, um, for me, uh, in my function as president, my privilege is to meet uh, these scientists. And it's a fantastic privilege because they are doing uh, great science with uh, passion. And uh, for many of them, I know that ERC really has been an important uh, moment in their scientific life. So I hope we can continue this. Uh, and uh, my second point is that I, we really hope that we can continue this. That is, the, for the uh, next framework program, which, as you know, will be called Horizon Europe, which is the whole purpose of these uh, research innovation days. I think the, what has been proposed in Pillar 1 uh, is uh, to have uh, the ERC. The ERC will die on the 31st of December 2020, but will be reborn on the 1st, December, 1st January 2021. And uh, in a form which, uh, for the moment, and we hope it is going to continue like this, basically untouched from the present situation. And for us, a very important element is the power which has been given to the Scientific Council, which have the honor of chairing. And uh, this power is quite considerable, because we are the ones to decide how we spend the money given to our disposal. And the second is, of course, the, uh, cho the choice uh, choosing the evaluators. This is the full responsibility of Scientific Council. And for us, it's, we know that if we don't have the right evaluators, ERC will not be what it is. So we are depending on uh, high, sci uh, high quality scientists being involved in the evaluation and using them properly and dealing with them uh, in the right way. So this is uh, very important. And for that purpose, I want, and that's the end, my second point, I want to say how much we owe to the uh, organization which is supporting the ERC, the executive agency which has been in charge uh, since, uh, uh, since, well, 10 years now. We celebrated 10 years of ERC recently. And uh, really, we are, um, we are extremely grateful to the dedication, professionalism of people from the ERCA. My third point is really, for many of you, I'm sure um, some of you are scientists, some of you are policymakers, some of you are people who um, have uh, involved in uh, politics in some way. So for us, we know there's still a big question mark. I told you the structural question mark is basically over, but there's still a big question mark, which is the budget. And of course, as you know, we know each year we have typically 500 people we thought we should be funding that we cannot fund because we are missing money. At this moment, we are funding every year more than 1,000 grants, giving more 1,000 grants. This year, even more than 1,100 grants. And so we, we know that we could use uh, more money uh, in the right way. So I hope we can do that. And in order to do that, we have to have a good budget. And my final point is to say that the proposal by the European Commission uh, meant for ERC, remember that the proposal of the Commission was a budget for 27 countries, not 28. Maybe tomorrow we will learn that actually we stay 28. We have to see. Um, and um, so that's uh, the, the whole point uh, of uh, the proposal of the Commission was definitely for ERC a significant increase of the budget. But maybe we can even have a better increase than the one proposed to the Commission. It was 50 some percent. Always difficult to object to a 50 percent increase of your budget. But uh, anyway, we can still hope for more. So I leave you with uh, great uh, speakers you will listen to now. 
And thank you very much for your participation. And we count on your support for the ERC in the future, but for science, uh, for frontier science altogether, you know this has been uh, something which has been, uh, people have started to question. I'm just finishing uh, yesterday, uh, just a few hours, one hour ago, I was with the Commissioner Gabrielle about uh, pre helping her with preparing your interview by the Parliament on Monday. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Jean-Pierre, for framing the discussion. Uh, and I suggest we invite now our four speakers on stage. So as I said, we have four uh, distinguished scientists, CRC grantees. Uh, so we have Heino Falke, Professor of Astroparticle Physics and Radio Astronomy from the University of Nijmegen. Uh, Anna Cagno, uh, Associate Professor from the Center for Research in Agricultural Genomics from Barcelona. Uh, Muki Haklai, uh, Professor of Geographic Information Science from University College London. And Camila Colombo, Associate Professor from the Department of Aerospace Science and Technology uh, from the Polytechnic University uh, of Milan. So if you would, the four of you would like to join us on stage. And I think Heino is going to kick us off. Um, so we're talking about dreaming the future. And I think uh, you're going to share your dreams uh, and uh, also some of the achievements that you've, uh, you've uh, reached uh, with your research. Thanks. Thank you. I, I, I'm understandable. That's great. If I see the slides, then it'll be even better. Uh, the first talk on, on the Mac. In the back, yes, wonderful. Uh, I can only agree with what President Bourgeonnet said about uh, the ERC. I, mean, I was never part of a big, powerful institution, but I had an ERC grant. In fact, I had two, and that made my career. That really changed my life. Um, and the project I'm talking about is the Event Horizon Telescope, um, is a, a synergy grant uh, funded together, uh, what we organized together with Luciano Rezzola and Michael Kramer. Uh, from Frankfurt and from uh, Bonn. And of course, this is about uh, astronomy. Um, and so this is not, unfortunately, blue sky research, it's dark sky research. Um, and uh, if you go into space, um, your perspective will change. And not only your perspective, but also uh, space and time will change how you experience it. And that has all to do with the theory of Albert Einstein. And I remind you, the theory of Albert Einstein was based on and confirmed by observations, completely useless observations of astronomers at the time. But you use it all the time. Because what Einstein was predicting was that space and time would be curved and coupled. And a consequence of that is that today clocks here in Brussels run 30 microseconds slower per day, not slower than the other countries, but slower than in space. So here on Earth, time runs slower, 38 microseconds per day. And that is something you have to correct for if you use your navigation system, GPS. Because if you would not use Albert Einstein's theory of, theory of relativity almost every day in your car navigation system, you'd be off by 10 kilometers after one day. So most of you would not have even made it here today. Um, so, um, and that's only because some pesky astronomers found some minute deviations in the motion of Mercury, for example. Now, let's make a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. What happens if we compress that Earth further and further? Okay, we get some problems. First of all, with Greta Thunberg, I guess, you know, because you know, we won't have uh, much uh, pleasure living here. The second uh, consequence will be that time will go slower and slower with respect to the rest of the universe. So the rest of the universe will suddenly go on fast forward until it spins really fast, the rest of the universe, because you are slowing down. And the third consequence is, and maybe is much, much better consequence, is you become very attractive. You'll be attracting uh, light much stronger uh, than now. Uh, and in fact, once you compress the Earth to the size of the thumb, roughly, you create the event horizon. The point where light is so strongly attracted that it will disappear behind that horizon. And the fact that all information will disappear forever inside that event horizon. You have created, essentially, a black hole. One of the bizarrest objects that there are in the universe. Now, this was pure fantasy. 
Do these things exist? We have some evidence that there are hundreds of millions of objects which might be black holes in our Milky Way. There's probably a big, massive black hole at the center of every galaxy. But you know, that was my dream. You're know, talking about dreams. I always wanted to see that. I want to see a black hole into the eye, so to speak. We figured you'd have to build a telescope not the size of the Earth in, at two centimeters, but the size of the Earth at 10,000 kilometers. You need a telescope that big to see black holes. So we built one. And that's what we did with uh, the Event Horizon Telescope and with a large fraction of European and ERC funding. And so this shows you a live display that we sort of made during the observations in 2017 in April. It's speed up. Uh, and what you see are telescopes spread around the world looking at sources as they pass over the sky. M87 is one of them. It's a galaxy in the constellation of Virgo. And two others, quasars, 3C273 and 3C279. These are the first quasars ever discovered. You know, the Earth rotates, the sources pass overhead, and different telescopes look at it from different sides. And by looking from different sides, you can get very precise uh, images that you can make, precise structural information. The larger away, the further away, the better, the sharper your view. The more telescopes you have, the better your image. And so this was the minimum amount of telescopes we were able to, we, 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 you can actually need in order to make an image. We would like to have more in the future. Um, but this is what we did in April 2017. Uh, and the resolution you get that is that of a mustard seed in New York, as seen from Brussels. Um, and what we saw really you know, surprised not only us. I mean, actually, the reactions of the rest of the world surprised me even more than what we saw. And I'll take you back to the moment when we actually showed that very first image, actually, here in Brussels at the European Commission. Um, and we make now a zoom, the biggest zoom you can actually make uh, in astronomy, of a billion or so fa zoom factor, into, uh, into the black hole. Music was made by my son, by the way. Let's make a film music. And so we're zooming into Virgo, constellation. And there's a galaxy that was discovered in Paris in the 19th century from the center of Paris. That was still possible. You see an image, a radio image, a big bubble of gas that we took with a LOFA telescope, a European telescope again in, in, in all over Europe. And then you see this thing coming out, this jet, this stream of gas, which was already discovered 100 years ago. But it was pointing to a central region, which we never saw. Then you zoom in, and you saw that. And what you see is this ring of fire, as I described it at the press conference. This is where light is bent around the black hole. And you see this darkness in the very center. This is where light actually disappears in the event horizon. This is a point where actually all information is lost. Yeah, all hope is lost once you go inside. Um, and the time seems to come to a standstill. This is the highest resolution image that we've made so far. Uh, and it confirms beautifully the predictions that we made uh, of how black holes should look like. Except for the color, of course. The color is something that's artistic. Now, that image was actually scientifically very important because the first time we see a black hole, but also for some reason resonated with the rest of the public. It was front page on almost all uh, newspapers around the world. I was told by, by the European Southern Observatory, four and a half billion people saw that image. Um, and, you know, it was a Brexit day. It was one of these Brexit conferences. Yet the tweet about this image from the U European Commission was the most popular of all tweets ever. Okay? This was a scientific image. was the most popular tweet of the European Commission. Uh, of course, social media, you know, had also fun with it. Um, <laughs> We'll keep going, we'll make more images, we'll make better images, we only want to make movies. I want to have more telescopes. Um, we actually, I'm dreaming of a telescope in Africa because we need the world to participate and this is where Africa can really help us to round off th this telescope. Uh, we also start an outreach program in, uh, in Africa with this planetarium. And, you know, just by chance, that very planetarium you'll feel, you find downstairs in the exhibition area. And you can see the, the black hole itself in virtual reality. And you can get a little planetarium tour as well. Thank you.
Heine, you're welcome to, to stay on stage. Uh, um, so next up, uh, without further delay, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Ana Cano Delgado, um, who's going to bring us down to earth, uh, I think, and talk about uh, her field of science. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I am a plant scientist, so we're going from space to earth. I actually work with um, with roots, with the roots of a plant. I've been working for 20 years in plant genetics, and I got an ERC consolidator grant in 2016 to try to implement the know-how that we have generated in the last 15, 20 years of research in the fundamental plant biology research to provide solutions to, to agriculture. So, you know, it is obvious that we are under a climate crisis, uh, climate crisis uh, Especially this week, we have the Climate Summit in New York. We all are aware of this. We have a climate mission from the Horizon Europe coming in the next years. And uh, in such a situation, we have a uh, terrible drought conditions. This is just a panorama for the desertization that we, we are uh, suffering in the planet. And the consequences of that is that you have uh, a severe uh, drought, and you have severe drought means that you have uh, a great agricultural losses. So it means that drought can provoke about 40% of the agricultural losses worldwide, in some regions of the planet even higher. And this is very, very uh, bad news because this threatens food security. We are under a risk of uh, not having enough food for all. So nowadays, one of the only possible solutions that we can face using biotechnology to really increase the production of crops in such a deficit of water is using biotechnology. And uh, what I have been proposing through the last years, and is actually the hypothesis of the ERC, is that we have been for many years working in this very small group of cells that you see here in the slides. These are the stem cells of the root. This is just the root apex, it's digging to the soil, and these green light cells are just in charge of piloting whole root seeds growing and moving, looking for the stimuli, looking for the water. And uh, we have the idea that rather than using the whole plant to make plant resistance, because we want to produce plants that are more tolerant to the drought, that are able to grow and produce without water, we were just thinking that probably we could just engineer a few cells of the plant to make plants resistance to drought. Why we thought that? Because normally when you manipulate the whole plant architecture, if you, you can make plant resistance to drought, and this has been achieved in the last 30 years, but those plants are typically very dwarf, and those plants are not producing more. Although you have plants resistance to drought, you have a penalization in growth. And this has been a problem in agriculture, and we thought that by just modifying some cells, some few cells, we could probably kind of trick the plants to make plants react to the lack of water, but keep growing, okay? And uh, this is uh, not only a hypothesis, but we have worked very hard through our hypothesis, and we could have demonstrated that just working in these few cells, actually the vascular cells of the plant in which we modified some receptor signaling, we could be able not only to change the responses in the root, but in the whole plant. And we were able to produce plants that are resistant to drought, to severe drought. These plants are like two weeks of severe drought, but also are plants that are growing normally. And uh, this, as you see there, you, you can see these plants. This is Arabidopsis. You are probably not familiar if you are not plant biologists, because the Arabidopsis is like the mouse for the cancer biologists, for plant science. It's just a model. We don't eat Arabidopsis, but we are interested in providing agricultural solutions. So we decided that we could use these studies to looking for solutions in agriculture, and we could translate our know-how in such a model system to valuable crops. And we did that in particular in, cere in cereals, because you know cereals are suffering for the lack of water. We need, I mean, cereals is grown in, in dry lands all, uh, around the world. And in particular, I choose this uh, model, the sorghum, because it's a cereal that is naturally very high, highly resistant to drought. And uh, not many groups work in sorghum, but uh, I always say it's avant-garde cereal because 
now the number of groups working has a series of advantages that is turning this serial more fancy and more interesting. But in particular for us, it's a model system. And we choose the sorghum because it also, it also has a beautiful root compared to other cereals like wheat or mice. This, this sorghum has a very thin root that can let us go to the microscope and look in a very precision those cells that are piloting the responses of the plants, the plant stem cells. And we have been able to introduce new methodologies from the model system into crops to start understanding what are the molecular mechanisms behind the cereal adaptation to drought stress. So one thing that is very, very important for us is the introduction of uh, CRISPR-Cas technologies, or what you call genome editing. Genome editing, uh, we can use in, in, in scientific terms, but so far we have a very strict uh, regulation by the European Union that is uh, limiting the capabilities of uh, genome-edited cereals to go to the market. This is something that I would like to call your attention because it is very important for plant scientists in order to uh, be able to, to communicate to society, to give solutions to social problems, to get the support of politicians, and in particular in the European Union, because the European Union is being uh, somehow uh, limiting the advance of, or the introduction of these genome edition technologies into, into the society. And I think this is uh, due mainly to a misunderstanding because now, uh, CRISPR or genome edited plants are considered uh, transgenics and in fact these plants are not transgenics, they are considered GMO and GMO is a very big bug when you introduce many different kinds of mutated plants but actually uh, the te technology wise genome edited plants are not actually transgenics because this technology involves that you just modify some nucleotides of the DNA, not necessarily introducing an exogenous gene from another organism into the plant, which is a transgenic. So if we want to provide solutions in agriculture, here in Europe it's necessary that we go and support the new technologies and the technologies that under the safety regulations are able to produce cereals that are more resistant to the warming, the warming planet and to the climate change. And uh, basically the, the overall of the grant is about this, it's about very bottom-up research, studying very specific cells, the stem cells, for many years. I never thought five years ago that those studies could lead me to start thinking that with such a kind of fundamental research, we can start providing solutions to a societal problem, and we are now in the middle of it, okay? So, finally, I would like to really us to your policymakers and politicians, I would like to use this scenario to do this. It is very important that you guys rely on scientists to decide how we want the modern agriculture, how we want to design the next generation of crops. There are a lot of things in risk. Genome edition tools are highly democratic and we really have to support them to not get isolated in Europe because first world countries like Canada and Japan are now producing genome edited uh, crops that are going into the market with no risk. So for us to be able to get in contact with the, public, with, the, with the society, with the public engagement, we really need, as scientists, the support of the politicians. And this is a very, very uh, special moment now to get those bounds very well tight. I would like to thank the ESC because uh, Without them, I wouldn't be here. I, they give me the opportunity to scale up my group from five people to 15 people, to meet a lot of very interesting people like Professor Bourguignon, which is a very special uh, scientist, and many of you that are coming here today. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Anna. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Muki Haklai, um, who is a professor, as I said, of geographic <laughs> information science, uh, also a great advocate and uh, practicing, practicing citizen science. And I think you're speaking lights. also at this event at a session uh, later today that's precisely on citizen science. But thank you very much for being yeah. with us here. But we check. Thank, you ver thank you very much. And I'm going to talk about my project, but within the wider context. And it's called Extreme Citizen extreme citizen science analysis and visualization. And I would expect that 
you won't know much about citizen science. It's a relatively new area that evolved and, and emerged and, and erupted actually over the past 10 years, although practice within it can be traced very long time back. Now, in a new area, you would think everything is frontier, but actually there are frontiers even in emerging areas. And this is a good example of that. You take citizen science, which is the participation of the general public in scientific projects, which can be helping scientists to classify galaxies or helping ecologists to collect samples in the environment, and you look who is actually participating in them. And you discover that in many of them, the participants are highly educated. There are projects even with 10% to 25% of people on, in, on the volunteering side holding a PhD. Not only that, you take these people who are highly educated and you tell them to classify images or collect a bit of data. You don't engage them in the full scientific process from problem solving all the way to action. This actually opened up the opportunity to explore the extremities of citizen science practice. This is the extreme in the extreme citizen science. And one of the extremes that we specifically work on is to think, can we engage people without literacy in the scientific process and work with them throughout? Work with them so they can help us to shape the problem, shape the data collection, involve in the data collection, and even in the analysis. And that's what the Exanvis project is all about. So this is where we have started. And to do these things, we're actually linking three disciplines as the core. So I'm a mix between geography and computer science based on my background, and I'm very, very closely with Dr. Jerome Lewis from the Department of Anthropology. Now, from the social science perspective, anthropology and geography seem somewhat similar. They both have this colonial heritage that, that they've done. They're kind of now struggling with post-colonialism. They're both dealing with their areas and with different parts of the world. But actually, they are fundamentally different. They have a different worldview. They have fundamentally different methodologies and ways of doing the world. And even with that, we're kind of mixing up with computing, where people are coming up and just solving problems. And that's what they are interested in. And you get things like what you see above, which is different bits of software uh, string together. But what if we create a software that is embedded inside the process that takes into account culture, local networks, local practices, and then think how people can be truly involved in the data collection process. So we develop a software uh, called Sapeli, which is being developed in the field. And this time we have anthropologists who are deeply familiar with communities, but not that familiar with XML and other formats of programming, and helping them to create a software in a participatory process that takes a, a free and prior informed consent with local communities and use different paper. And if you remember my opening slide, there was papers on the floor in a village in uh, Cameroon. And that's being collected. Once it's that collected, they can come up with the software. Now, then that is being stored in a database. And you can't just use any old database, because when you're working with culture, you need to think about different initiation cycle. You think, need to think about different people with different uh, rights to do it. And your all kind of computer science permission don't always do the whole trick. And now, in order to make it a full citizen science, and that's the innovation that the ERC allow us to, to kind of start thinking about, is that we know from the West that when people see what they've done, they get engaged more. So we are doing the visualization tool and develop new tools to allow people without literacy to collect data, but also to see what they have done. And this is done through very careful consideration throughout the process. So what kind of things we are doing? For example, in the Nainai Conservancy in Namibia, we ask different questions. One of the questions that you see there is the question of the following. We know sort of from anecdotes that a lot of people can read aerial images and satellite images. But what the scale? And what exactly 
can they do that? Out of our research, I can now tell you for certain that any human being can actually understand aerial photographs of the area, even if they never seen it before. Not only that, with the right configuration, they can recognize specifically routes, and if it's connected to their places, they can do a lot of things. Now, Megan Lowe's, Dr. Megan Lowe's, who is actually doing the research there, also using it to understand in anthropological research, kinship and relationship between people and how they link to different villages in the conservancy. We also ask in computer science and uh, interaction how people can actually interact with interfaces that allow them to start seeing the information. Another example of what the ERC actually allowed us to do is with uh, the Maasai in the Maasai Mara. And luckily, we're working together with uh, Professor uh, Jackie McGlade, who was the head of the European Environment Agency and then at the UN Environmental Program. And she's working there and kind of mixing local knowledge with satellite information. The Maasai have collected quickly uh, 170 types of plants. And that's also give you already idea about the level of local knowledge. And with the app that we've developed with Sapeli, they, within six weeks, collected 3,000 points of data that allow to record grazing or fire damage or drought damage and all the rest of it. And that become part of the African data cube. And that's starting to demonstrate that indeed any community regardless of literacy, can participate fully in the citizen science. And that's actually the really exciting bit about citizen science. It's not just someone classifying a bit of galaxy. It is not public engagement. It is much more. People get into the full process of the scientific practice and doing that in a full way. Not only that, notice how this project is actually bridging across issues like responsible research and innovation, getting into open science, can address missions. And you can see that, that it's actually not a contradiction to combine those things. It's actually integral to how you do good research. And with the coming missions and other things, we can actually do science that is really of that level. And that's kind of the final point about the ERC, because I'm also lucky to be a panelist in one of the panels that in my area. And I can see this range of wonderful proposal Professor Bunginion mentioned to us. And you always have the really tough choice of choosing which one will get in. But you see this interest in, in the cr critical issues of today, the climate crisis, the environmental crisis, and we have a whole range of fundamental science that is both answering questions and one of our core kind of uh, extra question is what does the GPS coordinates of the forest spirit mean? On one side, the GPS coordinate, as we just heard, is relying on Einstein equations. On the other side, it is the forest spirit after all. So, that kind of thing is possible because of the ERC. There is nothing like that in the social sciences that allow the range, the interdisciplinarity, and the work of it, but also it allowed to address major societal problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Muki. So our fourth and final speaker in this session uh, is Camila Colombo. Um, Heino began by taking us to space, and I think you're taking us back to space now, and particularly the thorny issue of how to deal with space debris. So thank you, Camila. Thank you. Um, in uh, this uh, uh, project, uh, I will uh, show you how to surf in space uh, for uh, having a more uh, sustainable uh, environment and sustainable future. Uh, spacecraft is now a, uh, spacecraft and space activities are now a fundamental asset of our life uh, due to the services that are offered to our daily life uh, from uh, a satellite. If you think a lot of uh, apps that you have on your mobile are enabled by satellites like uh, geolocation, telecommunication, uh, internet broadband, uh, monitoring of the condition on the Earth uh, uh, for global warming, weather forecast, but also space missions are uh, enabled 
enabling the boosting of new technologies that then are used also on ground. Um, as a, a spacecraft engineer, we have a, a very great opportunity to uh, go and explore space. However, with that comes also a great responsibility, that is uh, to uh, in order to offer all of these services, uh, you can see them uh, if uh, we take a map and we color each point of this map based on the services that are provided by spacecraft, uh, this map will become all colorful. However, uh, with these opportunities comes also the responsibility of uh, taking care of the space environment as we try to take care of uh, any environment on Earth. And uh, this is due to the many uh, space debris objects that now are orbiting around the Earth. Little by little, we are creating our artificial ring uh, around the Earth. Uh, there are, at the moment, 22,000 uh, debris objects which are regularly tracked from telescope on ground. However, if we look at the smaller uh, space debris, for example, uh, the one up to 10 centimeter or even below, uh, for smaller sizes between one centimeter and 10 centimeter, their number gets larger and larger. Uh, with statistical model, we can predict that, that, are, that there are millions of objects of uh, sizes smaller than one millimeter. All these objects uh, are uh, threatening space activities uh, because uh, they can collide with satellites uh, and uh, therefore uh, create uh, um, accident in space. Uh, if uh, we look uh, at the trend and the, uh, the growth of uh, space debris, uh, since uh, the beginning of the space activity, it's very interesting to note that they have uh, an exponential growth. Like many other uh, uh, environmental problems on ground, like the acidification of the oceans or uh, the CO2 emission. Uh, this is uh, a signal that we have to take care of this problem now. Uh, what is in common between uh, uh, space services, uh, which are enabled by orbit and space transfer, and uh, uh, space debris, and uh, in general space situation awareness, which is uh, uh, the uh, science that monitor and safeguard space activities from space debris, but also from uh, Earth, uh, near -Earth, Earth asteroids, which are instead natural bodies orbiting the Sun. All these uh, uh, fields of research, they have in common the modeling of the dynamics. In fact, uh, to model the dynamics of a satellite or a space debris, we can consider the main gravitational force of the central body, uh, but there are also other natural forces called orbit perturbation, which are due, for example, to the, uh, to the, uh, artificial, uh, to the gravitational attraction of the Earth and the Sun. The idea of the COMPASS project is to leverage the dynamics dynamics of these natural forces and to develop techniques for allowing the spacecraft to surf by using these natural forces. So we use mathematical model to understand the long-term evolution of orbits and then we calculate the artificial maneuver that a satellite can give with, with its own engine to then surf by exploiting these natural forces. Uh, this idea has uh, many potentialities, uh, in particular for a space transfer, uh, to reduce the amount of propellant on board that is very costly, and therefore to allow uh, more mission, more complex mission, especially for small satellites. Uh, while looking at space debris, it has the advantage of creating new opportunities for space exploration and space exploitation and uh, mitigating uh, the problem of uh, space debris. Um, I cannot go uh, into the detail of the, all the outcome of the project, but I uh, chose three examples to show how fundamental research can then uh, see its way up to the, uh, you, the future use in our real life. Uh, for example, uh, with the model developed in this uh, project, we are able to uh, model the dynamics of this million of uh, space debris through an approach that doesn't require a long computational time, as you could imagine, having so many objects to, uh, to propagate. Uh, so we are able to predict the evolution of space debris in orbit and also to predict the effect that a fragmentation can have uh, in orbit. Uh, this is, uh, 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 we'll have the future, um, 
advantage of being able to uh, foresee the future of space debris and therefore uh, to decide rules and uh, uh, guidelines to control uh, their growth. But also we are working on the development of an index, uh, for example, very simple, like uh, the uh, indexes that are used to um, uh, for uh, electrical appliances. So an index that is able to quantify the impact that a space mission has on the environment in order to keep uh, our uh, space environment uh, sustainable. Uh, still, uh, in the field of space debris, um, a problem are collisions uh, in between satellites or satellite and space debris. Uh, within this project, we have def uh, developed uh, a method to calculate uh, co collision avoidance maneuver. So the maneuver that uh, a satellite has to perform in order to avoid uh, a collision with the space debris. Uh, this is quite important for the future because uh, having so many debris in orbit uh, will require the development of uh, uh, space traffic management that will be, should be done autonomously like uh, is done now on Earth for uh, uh, space, uh, for uh, traffic management or for air management. And finally, uh, a proof of uh, this uh, concept is already flying in orbit and uh, is uh, thanks to the mission Integral, is a mission of uh, the European Space Agency and uh, is a mission that reached its end of life in 2014. The satellite didn't have enough uh, propellant in order to re-enter directly on Earth. Uh, so what we did in collaboration with the European Space Agency was to compute a maneuver uh, that the satellite gave with the, the propellant uh, remaining on board and now the satellite is uh, flying uh, in space, uh, surfing, uh, following uh, the, um, the gravitational attraction of the moon and will naturally re-enter uh, in 2028, therefore uh, reducing uh, the number of space debris of uh, one. Uh, if uh, mm, the, mm, this uh, ERC project uh, uh, might hopefully have uh, some impact uh, on uh, uh, space uh, activities and uh, on uh, the development uh, of, um, of science in this field, uh, for sure it changed my life and the life of uh, uh, 11 of researchers and postdoc working in my team, but also of the life of many people that we met during this project. And uh, if you are ask me why bottom-up research, I would answer with uh, four points. First, because a, a project like this uh, gives the opportunity to dare having uh, very uh, novel ideas and gives you especially the time to uh, look into those ideas uh, because it's a very long project and it allows you to have uh, a big group of people working on it. Uh, second, because in that way, by participating to conferences or to committees, uh, for example, we work in the Interagency Debris Committee or the Committee for the Planning of Future Mission to Asteroid, it uh, helps uh, to feed new ideas that come from science uh, into uh, the science community, in, our, in my case, into space agencies uh, and uh, into industry. So it brings the idea of scientists uh, to the people that then decide what to do. Third, because uh, uh, this kind of research project inspire researchers, uh, not only researchers, but all the many students, uh, adults, families that we meet uh, in all the outreach event. This is uh, uh, a picture of an example of an outreach event. By the way, you are invited to visit our stand where you can see uh, space debris in virtual reality. And finally, because uh, it's, uh, um, this kind of project are preparing the future generation, uh, not only of scientists, but also of entrepreneurs, of engineers, and uh, also of policy makers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Camilla. So that almost brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, in the space of one hour, as you can appreciate, we've only had the opportunity to prevent, uh, to present you with a very small snapshot of the kind of uh, research that ERC grantees are carrying out and the way in which ERC grants are, as the title of this uh, session suggests, empowering researchers to dream the future. 
Um, I would very much encourage you, as Camilla said, to go down to the exhibition space, which is near the VIP entrance, and you can meet uh, Camilla and her colleagues from the Compass Project and also uh, Hino's team from the Black Hole Cam Project. Uh, there's the virtual reality exhibit that Camilla mentioned, and Hino and his colleagues have a very cool pop-up planetarium uh, that you can visit. And if you want to find out more about the kind of fundamental research, frontier research that the ERC is supporting, please do visit our website. We have many more examples of uh, fascinating research carried out by grantees that you can uh, find there. So thank you very much uh, to you for attending. And please, let's thank again our four speakers uh, for being here with us and for presenting their research.